final preparations. So what we're going to do here basically is to set up a user called LFS, which will build the initial part of Linux from scratch. So we'll create the required directory layout by running the following as root. All right, and once again, I'm just going to check that we have got the LFS variable. I don't want to trash my host system in any way at all. So it is set. If I was running this as a normal user, it wouldn't matter so much because the system itself wouldn't get altered because the normal user wouldn't have normally have access to the system. But as we're root, um, it's quite critical to ensure we know exactly what we're doing. So those commands have been put in. Um, and they've all worked correctly. It's worth checking. Uh, as you, as we go through, you'll notice that I'll be copying and pasting individual commands, and that's just for safety. That's to ensure that each command isn't producing an error. Um, it's quite easy for commands to produce a lot of output, and if you've got several commands stacked up, you can't see the output of each individual command. Um, and it's quite easy to miss an error then. Uh, so these commands are quite straightforward. You can see straight away if there's been any errors there, which there hasn't. Um, but uh, most of the commands coming going forward will be just putting in one at a time. <clears throat> so create a tools directory where the cross compiler will reside. And now we're going to add an LFS user. So we add a group for it and then we actually add the user called LFS. And there's no output there so that indicates as you know in Linux environment, Unix environment, no output is good. Generally it's good. Set a password for this user. Something that obviously you won't forget. And now we grant this new LFS user access to various parts of the system, the new file system. You can see this is all under MNT LFS. And if I show you what's the state of the LFS partition, as you can see, we've got the semblance of a, a, a normal root system here, like a nascent um, root system at the moment. We've got some of the key directories that you'd see on any Linux um, operating system such as etc, uh, lib64 user and var and you can see that bin and lib are sim links to subdirectories within user. So it, you can see the, the system is already starting to be built up from scratch. Um, if a separate working directory is created as suggested give the user LFS ownership of this directory so I'll do that and now log in as user LFS so we're now that user we need to set an environment up a, st a stable environment for the LFS user so it's not the environment the system is created by default it's a specific environment that we require for building Linux from scratch so the first one sets a profile um, and it, you can see it sets the uh, shell that's going to be used and some of the parameters that the shell uses. <clears throat> and then we set some defaults for when we log in. And you'll notice one of them is to configure the LFS variable to point at the environment, uh, sorry, the location of the partition that we'll be building in. And there's some explanation there about all the different options in those settings. Um, it says there's several commercial distributions add a non-documented docu non instantiation of etc bash bash rc to the initialization of bash. This file has the potential to modify the LFS user's environment in ways that can affect the building critical LFS packages. To make sure the LFS user's environment is clean, check for the present of it, presence of it. And if present, move it out of the way as a root user run this. So if we run this and it produces no output which it hasn't then it's not a problem if it does produce an output you'll need to become the root and rerun the command um, you'll see what it does it it checks for the existence of this file and if it exists 
it does this move command. Well, if it did exist and it attempted to do that move command, it would have failed because those files are only accessible by root. So we know for sure that that, that file doesn't exist. Um, one thing I'm going to do, well, let's do the source bash profile first of all. And that sets up the new environment. Uh, so nothing's happened, but um, if I echo LFS, which I should have done before we've done source because it wouldn't have existed, but you can see LFS exists because it's been set in the bash RC. Um, there's a bit here about SBUs, which are standard build units. Um, basically, the first package, you time it, and that time is a standard build unit, is one standard build unit. So if, if the first package took five minutes to build, that standard build unit is five minutes long. It then means if you get another package that says it's going to take um, two standard build units, you know you multiply your five minutes, which is one standard build unit, by two, you get ten minutes, then that's the guide of how long that, that package will take to build. And it is just a guide. Don't don't take it as a literal um, number that it will take that long. It's purely an estimate. And the estimates will vary depending on whether swap's going to be used, how much memory you've got, what architecture you've got, whether it's on 32-bit, 64-bit, and so on. There's, um, even down to the speed of the disk you're using. If you're using a slow disk and a mechanical disk, you'll get a different SBU than compared if you're using a um, SSD or, or NVMe disk. Next bit is about parallelizing some of the uh, compiles, which is something that tended to cause problems previously, but in recent years as multi-cored processors are the norm, have been norm for a number of years now, <clears throat> it makes sense to try and use those cores to decrease the compile time, especially if you're on a slower machine. Um, it can make a difference, even if it's a, one of the early core 2 machines, uh, yeah, Core 2 machines um, with only um, hyper-threading on, it would still make a little bit of an improvement rather than running on a single thread. Um, and we can set a flag here, uh, an environment variable called make flags, which tells make to um, run as many jobs as we specify. Um, be sure that you set a figure after the J. If you don't set a figure, using minus J by itself tells make to spawn as many threads as it, as it can at once. And if you did that, you'd quickly run out of memory. You'd need yeah, many gigabytes of memory to allow uh, certain packages to build some of the bigger packages. A lot of the smaller packages, you could do that and get away with it, but um, uh, you'd certainly come unstuck with some of the bigger packages. So on this machine, I've got 24 threads at my disposal, so I'm going to make use of all, use of all those threads. Um, I have to say, with the old lake, I'm still testing it. I have noticed sometimes some compilations fail, um, and I'm assuming, I know it's now it's not down to overheating. Um, I'm assuming it's down to the fact that the kernel's still in early stages of uh, being able to deal with the older lake. Um, and I think it might be some, down to something to do with the different types of cores. So it may happen when I'm compiling that it might just abort. Um, and in that case, I may override the number of jobs down to just the number of performance cores, which is 16. Um, but for most of the build, uh, well, for all the build, I'm hoping there won't be any issues like that. So the best thing to do with this is to edit um, the bash rc and actually add this make flags in as a separate entry so that it's always there if we need to log out of the lfs user and log back in again we won't forget to set it so, so i'm just going to change this to 24 the number of threads i've got if you've got more cores or fewer cores just alter that number to the maximum number of cores you've got um, if you're unsure how many cores you've got at your disposal, you can do something, something like LSCPU, which will give a summary. Um, so the number of cores is identified as 16, which is correct, but the number of threads 
looks like this figure here, 0 to 23. Um, did I actually think this told you number of threads? But, oh yes, there you are. 0 to 23 CPUs. Um, yeah, number of CPUs, 24. So you can see that I've got 24 effective CPUs at my disposal. So LS CPU, depending on what you run it at, on, that should show you um, what what number you can put in um, into that figure. I think there's another command. I can't think what it is now, which will actually explicitly tell you um, the number of cores. Is it this command with a switch? Maybe it's, let's try that, A, maybe only used with pass, passable format, okay, so it's quite, yeah, I can't think of it, there's, I'm sure there's a command which just explicitly gives you the number of CPUs and that's all it does, um, as I can't remember, uh, exactly what that is no, I can't remember that if I remember or maybe somebody could uh, leave a comment with what the command is uh, for anybody who's interested so I've set that make flags if I resource so if I do echo make flags You'll see it's not set at the moment, but if I resource the um, environment, you can see Make Flags is now set. So here's a bit about test suites, um, and it recommends to at least run them in Chapter 8. It's optional in the earlier chapters because you kind of got a system that's in limbo. You're relying on the host system to build the system that's going to build the final looks from scratch so it's kind of at that moment it will be partially the host system and partially the intermediate system that you're building so it's not really as critical to run tests and indeed if you did run them you may get false uh, results anyway because of the host system